A warm welcome to everybody to our second part of our lecture series, Moldova, a shared and separated history, Moldau, eine geteilte Geschichte. Um, yes, uh, very glad that we have such a huge audience again. And I have uh, the special honor to welcome um, my dear colleague, Andre Kushko from Chisinau this afternoon. He is an associate professor at the Department of History and Geography at the Yon Krianga State Pedagogical University in Chisinau. He holds a master and a PhD degree from the Department of History at the Central European University in Budapest and Vienna. And he was several times fellow of various renowned institutions as the New Europe College in Bucharest or the Gerda Henkel Foundation. And he was a Fulbright Visiting Scholar at the Department of History at the University of Maryland. For a number of years, he has been working on issues related to Bessarabia's symbolic geography, the competing Russian and Romanian visions of this contested region in the second half of the 19th century and the early 20th century, as well as on broader issues on Russian and Romanian intellectual history. He is the author of a number of uh, publications, but I, I especially want to mention one of them, his groundbreaking monograph, A Contested Borderland Competing Russian and Romanian Visions of Bessarabia in the late 19th and early 20th century, published at the CU Press in nine, 2017. And this is what Andre will share with us today. Moldova divided the long 19th century. Thanks for being with us today, Andre. And now the floor is yours. Florian, thank you very much for this kind introduction. And I'm very glad to be here, uh, or be virtually. Um, and since I am, I think, the only one who will be lecturing this semester, at least from Kishino itself, uh, I think uh, this, this would be, in a way, a fitting occasion to introduce uh, our audience to how Bessarabia came about, and also to how uh, this was part of a larger story. Uh, in a way, I would like to, uh, to start uh, first, by uh, saying that you know historiography of uh, uh, histo uh, of the larger region of uh, Moldavia, if we take it into uh, in its medieval, um, has has been at pains uh, to think of this region uh, together, starting from the early nineteenth century, in the sense that. Uh, during uh, this uh, formative period of, uh, um, of, uh, early, uh, of, the, uh, of the early 19th century, sorry, uh, we, we witnessed basically um, a uh, tripartite division of this former medieval principality. And uh, here I would like to dwell on two points actually that uh, Dr. Ursprung uh, shared with us uh, last week. Uh, first, to what extent can one compare the partitions of the, Molda the Moldavian Principality uh, to the Polish states? And second, uh, to what extent or in what way uh, was uh, the uh, population politics and the politics of colonization, of demographic, uh, you know, a reshaping of the region important for, uh, for the history of uh, uh, Moldavia, uh, historically speaking, in the uh, long 19th century. And I think these two points are very, uh, very important that could, could serve as a good starting point for our, for our discussion today. Uh, but before, uh, before dwelling on these two issues, uh, just a small caveat in English, uh, uh, there is also a terminological confusion regarding of how to call this region, uh, both the Romanian uh, side, the, the former principality that 
you know, uh, remained after the division in 1812, uh, and the later, uh, the later Republic of Moldova, because uh, Dr. Ursprung uh, made the, an excellent um, presentation uh, of, of the German conundrum, let's say, criminological conundrum last week. But I would only say that um, in English, uh, the convention is to call the historical principality as well as the Romanian province that we'll speak about today, Moldavia, whereas uh, the current Republic uh, would be called Moldova. And, but it's not followed you know, uh, consistently. So uh, I would just say that I will try to follow this convention uh, during my talk today in order not to confuse you further. I will mostly refer to Moldavia in the sense of the Romanian province and the historical principality. And of course, to Bessarabia and Bukovina, the other two, let's say, borderlands created by uh, the neighboring empires uh, in the late 18th and early 19th century by their acquired names, of course, by the names uh, coined and used by the empires who created them. So during this long 19th century, which I define roughly, uh, let's say, in the case of Bessarabia from 1812 to 1918, in the case of uh, Romanian uh, Moldavia, the former principality of Moldavia, uh, from 1821 to 1918, and in case of Bukovina, I guess, from 1775 to 1918. So there are three long 19th centuries here that we're we are talking about. Um, so uh, uh, during, during this uh, period, we can actually uh, sorry, we can actually talk about three imperial borderlands, as I uh, as I hinted at uh, hinted at earlier, um, in the sense that starting from 1775, when we have the consequence of the first partition of Poland, uh, uh, well, one could say the first partition of the Moldavian uh, principality, uh, the creation of the province of Bukovina. Uh, under the Austrian Empire, uh, we can uh, we, we witness a further uh, peripheralization of these regions uh, and a, a distribution of the um, you know of these three borderlands between the three dominant uh, geopolitically dominant powers of the wider region of Eastern Europe, that is the Ottoman, the Russian, and the Austrian empires. And uh, here is where I would, uh, I would dwell a bit on this uh, parallel, on this comparison with the Polish case. Because, of course, uh, there were structural similarities in the sense that uh, the geopolitical rivalry and uh, the uh, you know, competition for hegemony in, in, in Eastern Europe propelled uh, this vassal principality of the Ottoman Empire to the forefront of inter-imperial competition, and uh, that resulted in its partition. But of course, uh, aside from this structural similarity, there was a fundamental difference in the sense that uh, the Polish state was an independent state formation that was abolished by its uh, imperial, three imperial, uh, let's say, enemies, uh, to simplify. Whereas in the case of the Moldavian principality of the, of the medieval, uh, the early modern Moldavian principality, we cannot of course speak of an independent state. We can only speak about uh, a uh, province or be it a privileged province to some extent of the Ottoman empire. So that uh, when it was partitioned, it was not of course as a subject of international law, it was uh, as a province of the Ottoman Empire. So uh, the transactions that we are, the territorial transactions that we are uh, speaking about here, of course, concern only these, these three imperial players, that is the Ottomans, the uh, Austrians, and the Russians, and not Moldavia itself, uh, which remained an object for at least uh, of, of, you know, of other powers, uh, policies and interests, at least uh, during the first half of the uh, 19th century, if not later. Um, what is even more, uh, I would say, important to note here is the second issue that Dr. Ursprung uh, mentioned last week, uh, in the sense that there was this constant oscillation between the nomadic and sedentary uh, 
populations and especially the unstable character of uh, the settling process itself. That is, uh, the whole uh, Moldavian principality during its history from the 14th to the 18th centuries, and even more so, the two, uh, well, the three, if we count the principality itself, the two provinces that were created uh, and carved out of the principality by the Austrian and the Russian empires uh, were part of this complex frontier region of, uh, of the Pontic steppe, uh, which was characterized by uh, this constant oscillation, unstable relations between the nomads and the sedentary, uh, sedentary communities. Uh, and even more so, the empires themselves, when carving out these two provinces of Bessarabia and Bukovina, uh, they had a very important um, impact on their demographic, demographic structure uh, during their stories, their histories as imperial borderlands. Uh, and uh, the uh, population politics, if I may use this term a bit anachronistically, that these empires pursued in the two provinces. And again, uh, it, 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 uh, uh, these policies had really a formative, uh, a formative uh, impact on how uh, they became imperial borderlands. So the population politics was perhaps the most obvious and the most salient feature of uh, imperial policies uh, that really uh, reshaped, uh, transformed, and let's say modernized, uh, as we'll see uh, immediately, um, uh, these, uh, these borderlands. So, and the most obvious process of this demographic reshaping was of course colonization, both state-sponsored and spontaneous. Uh, and I would say that this uh, is one of the most important features that qualifies, uh, especially Bessarabia and Bukovina, but to some extent, the remaining territory of the Moldavian principality itself as, uh, as borderlands, as uh, spaces that are claimed by rival powers, that are transformed by these empires, and uh, that are redefined in the process. And this is very important to, to note from the beginning, because actually what we, have, what we have during the long 19th century on the former territory of the Moldavian principality are three, not completely antagonistic, but very different historical trajectories. Uh, so if, I, if we go back to this map, uh, which depicts right, all uh, the Moldavia, Wallachia, and Transylvania before 1812, uh, in, the early, uh, in the early 19th century, uh, we uh, can say that here this territory uh, of the Moldavian principality uh, would be profoundly reshaped and profoundly transformed. And these three trajectories, these three provinces will go their own way. And this also explains why uh, after 1918, uh, the reintegration of this, or the integration rather, of these provinces in the Romanian, into the Romanian nation state uh, would be rather difficult. Um, okay. Now, uh, I will start from the periphery. I will start from Bessarabia for obvious reasons. Uh, first of all, because Bessarabia is sort of the territorial core of the current Republic of Moldova but also because um, it sort of uh, maybe uh, represents and epitomizes in a more, uh, in a more distinct way uh, how the empire shaped uh, the, the borderlands, as I hinted earlier. So both Bessarabia and Bukovina, and that's also very important to note from the beginning, were created ex nihilo uh, by these empires, in the sense that there was no clear territorial precedent for either of these provinces. Uh, they were defined uh, post factum, they were, they were defined after they were annexed. Uh, the process of their, let's say, uh, description of their uh, placing on the map was a consequence of their annexation, uh, respectively to the Austrian in, case of, uh, in the case of Bukovina and to the Russian in the case of Bessarabia uh, empires. 
Uh, so, uh, in this sense, as, uh, as we'll see a bit later, uh, both provinces were structurally similar. Uh, uh, they were un unequivocally imperial creations. They, uh, both of them were imagined as um, territories that had to be somehow redeemed from the Ottoman yoke and thereby uh, redefined as quite different from the former Moldavian principality in different ways. So uh, let's start with, uh, with Bessarabia. Now, what kind of imperial borderland was this region? Uh, and uh, to answer this question, one should, uh, one should go back to the context of the early 19th century, when uh, there was a, a quite active uh, inter-imperial competition in the region. And besides the, the players I mentioned earlier, uh, the Ottomans, the Austrians, and the Russians, there was another short-lived but quite important player on the, uh, in the Balkan region uh, during the early 19th century, that is Napoleonic France. And uh, to fully understand how Bessarabia came about, one should also take into account that uh, the Russian authorities, and especially Emperor Alexander I, were very, um, you know, uh, very uh, invested in the effort to emulate Napoleonic France in many respects, and also to uh, sort of formulate a response, a reaction to Napoleonic policies. So uh, when, when Bessarabia was created, uh, it was in a, in a very peculiar context of this four player uh, imperial competition. And that is, explains why uh, the Russian authorities themselves were not quite certain where to place this new province when it was annexed in 1812, because its annexation itself was a last resort. The plan, uh, the initial plan was different altogether. The initial plan that the Russians devised was to annex uh, both principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia. And when they found themselves, let's say, in a hurry to stop the Napoleonic advance, they had to contend with what was left, that is uh, Bessarabia, the territory between the Prut and the Dniester rivers, roughly here. Um, so in a way, uh, uh, Bessarabia was from the, uh, from the beginning an unexpected province, let's put it this way. So, uh, and the Russian authorities were uh, at a, well, not at a loss maybe, but in a, uh, in a dilemma as how to define uh, this region in their uh, let's say a broader context of the of the uh, imperial borderlands. So, uh, as we as you can see from this slide, I uh, try to argue in my basically previous works that uh, to understand Bessarabia's history during the nineteenth century, uh, one should use three perspectives, three uh, points of view, three angles. The first is that Bessarabia was a transitional space. And up to an extent, it remained so throughout the 19th century, although, although its uh, status was uh, sort of uh, uh, more or less settled by the 1830s. Um, uh, in what sense? Uh, in the sense that Bessarabia was a transitional space between uh, the Russian Empire's Western peripheries, Western borderlands, uh, what we would today call Poland, Ukraine, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, on the other hand, the heavily colonized expanses of new Russia, Novorossiya, which is a term that is used today in many contexts that are not necessarily uh, congruent with its use in the 19th century, that is the North Pontic steppe, basically speaking, and its extension to the North. So Bessarabia was placed uh, discursively and also administratively between these two regions. On the one hand, the Western borderlands, which, uh, which enjoyed in the Russian authorities' perception uh, a local, well, some kind of local uh, elites which could be co-opted. And on the other hand, there were these uh, spaces of colonization of settler, of, of uh, bringing in settlers from abroad, like uh, New Russia, Novorossiya. Uh, which um, made Bessarabia itself, um, you know, uh, uh, well, split between uh, the north and the center, 
where R a Romanian uh, speaking population dominated and where uh, the Russian authorities tried to use an accommodative approach, at least initially, and to somehow uh, uh, lure, let's say, the local elites into cooperating with the empire. And on the other hand, we have this southern, uh, southern uh, Bessarabian region, we'll talk about it a bit later, uh, which was associated with uh, the space of colonization with New Russia. So this uh, resulted in what I call sp a spatial dualism in the region and a very, uh, a very um, different, let's say, uh, pattern of agricultural uh, uh, ownership, of land ownership, and a quite different profile of the population. Because again, in the north and especially the center, you have a Romanian speaking peasant majority. In the south, you have a very diverse, uh, very diverse settler population. Uh, Transdanubian colonists, Bulgarians, Gagaus, Germans, uh, and uh, some some other some other important communities uh, that were uh, like the Greeks at some point, uh, and also of course the Jewish community, which uh, to which we'll we'll return later, and which was rather a result of spontaneous colonization as opposed to the other settlers brought uh, brought to Bessarabia. The second perspective. Uh, on the Arabian history during the 19th century uh, starts from the premise that uh, this province was constructed again symbolically and administratively um, using two consecutive uh, concepts of imperial space. The first, which was dominant in the 1810s, 1820s, up to the early 1830s, uh, privileged the, the, the what I would call the direct gaze of imperial agents. That is. It, Bessarabia was constructed by traveling Russian dignitaries, traveling uh, in all kinds of uh, official capacities, starting from the Emperor uh, Alexander I himself, who visited the region in 1818, um, and uh, probably culminating with, uh, with this guy on my right, Prince Mikhail Vorontsov, who was uh, the uh, most defining figure of early Bessarabian history because he basically ch changed the status of the region within the Russian Empire symbolically. Uh, so this, uh, this direct gaze of imperial agents presupposed that uh, Bessarabia, Bessarabian space was construed as something that could be described on the spot that the imperial dignitaries involved in the administration of Bessarabia uh, could travel to the region and shape it in th through traveling, in so doing, right? So it was a direct approach. The second approach, uh, which started to dominate, let's say, the, uh, the, center, uh, the policies of the center, center of the Russian imperial authority, starting from the 1830s, was uh, much more abstract, much more impersonal and bureaucratic. And uh, basically, it, uh, it uh, encapsulated the tendency towards increasing centralization. So uh, these alternative concepts basically amounted to two alternative models of imperial space itself. One uh, uh, constructed through direct interaction with the region and the other constructed by the center, uh, more and more abstract, more and more impersonal. The third, uh, perspective, which became uh, much more important during the second half of the 19th century, uh, is uh, that of a contested borderland, and uh, to be more exact, as an object of rivalry and symbolic competition between the Russian Empire and the Romanian nation state. And what I, what, what I find specific about the Bessarabian case uh, it, it, that, uh, it is the fact that it was the only Russian territory that was claimed both by the empire and by a fully crystallized nation state. Uh, it was not that exceptional in itself, of course. Uh, so uh, we could think about other uh, competing national projects like the Polish national project and the Russian national project that claimed uh, not only the, po the Polish territories itself, I mean, this competition between these two uh, projects, but also uh, what, would, what we would define today as Belarus and part of Ukraine. But the specificity of, Bess of the Bessarabian case was that it was, let's say, uh, the only territory that had a homeland, uh, a national homeland on the other side of the border, 
that claimed it directly uh, during the second half of the 19th and the, the early 20th century. And uh, um, in this sense, Bessarabia was a contested borderland, uh, let's say, uh, in, in, um, in a more direct way than other territories of the Russian Empire claimed by opposing, uh, opposing projects, identity projects or identity uh, constructions. Um, okay. So just to, not to be too abstract myself, I would give you a, a con a two concrete examples of how uncertain Bessarabia's status was in the early Russian Empire. So uh, these two persons, uh, and we are oh, speaking here about this first period of shaping the province through direct intervention by imperial dignitaries. These two persons symbolized and uh, per like per personified two very different approaches to what, how Bessarabia should be constructed. The first here is a very colorful and important figure, Ioannis Kapodistrias, who is perhaps more important for Greek history. He was the first president of the Greek state, of the Greek Republic. But no, it's, he is no less important for Bessarabian history because before uh, returning basically to his native land and becoming a politician there, he was uh, the state secretary of the Russian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, responsible for Balkan affairs and specifically for uh, de designing Bessarabian administration. So in Kapodistrius's view, Bessarabia was to be a model province, a model Russian province for all the Balkan peoples we, who had to be liberated afterwards in, of course, the uh, perception of the Russian authorities. Uh, that is his, um, basically, his uh, idea was to um, establish an, a, 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 an autonomous administration in Bessarabia, which would co-opt local elites and which would serve again as a model for co-opting future Balkan Slavs, let's say, or uh, in any case, Orthodox Christians in the Russian Empire. So Kapodistria uh, had at this early stage, if we're talking here about uh, the period between 1812 and 1816, he had quite large ambitions for Bessarabia. Bessarabia was to be a showcase province. It was to uh, convince, in his view, the other Balkan peoples of the benevolence of the Russian administration. So that is why uh, he insisted on a lenient approach initially to local elites and to, uh, on a, uh, the introduction of an autonomous, well, quasi-autonomous uh, administration. Uh, well, uh, these hopes proved to be unfounded uh, and optimistic to say the least, so that uh, in a couple of years, uh, Kapodistria himself was uh, removed, let's say, from, uh, from the Russian, uh, uh, from the Russian administration for different reasons uh, in connection with the Greek uh, national uprising, a revolt. But uh, his design for Bessarabia failed spectacularly, so that by, the, by 1823, uh, the other individual here, Prince Mikhail Voronsov, had to be brought in. Voronsov who was uh, the second, but in fact, really the most important, perhaps, viceroy of New Russia and Bessarabia. And Voronsov is uh, very important, again, for redefining Bessarabia's status within the Russian Empire, because he almost single-handedly redefined the status of the province, again. So he was the one who shifted Bessarabia from this symbolic, uh, let's say, belonging to the Western borderlands of the Russian Empire and squarely placed it into New Russia, Novorossiya. So from this time on, uh, Bessarabia was linked to Odessa, and it was linked to this southern steppe, the Pontic steppe, the area of colonization. So the priorities of the Russian administration were no longer to placate their local elites and to grant them well, well, any sort of autonomy. Rather, the priorities of the Russian administration was to settle this land with co colonists in the southern part and to manage the Romanian-speaking peasantry and the other ethnic communities in the northern and central part uh, with, a, a, uh, with a view to, um, to uh, integrating Bessarabia as closely as possible with the other uh, provinces of the empire. So persons matter. Um, now, uh, I'm jumping here a bit uh, to the 1850s, 
because in the 1850s, another important geopolitical change occurred, which again transformed the whole landscape for, let's say, uh, at least a generation. Uh, and the new geopolitical reality was, of course, a direct consequence of the Crimean War, as a result of which Russia had to withdraw from the Danube Delta to, uh, as some of you probably know, of course, to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, reduce to a minimum its Black Sea fleet and to uh, renounce its ambitions uh, in, the, in, the, in the Balkans for, uh, for, for uh, at least for several decades. So what this meant for Moldavia and for Bessarabia was a new territorial uh, configuration that would last for 22 years between 1856 and 1878. And as you can see from the map here, if you compare it to the map, sorry, to the map here, right? Focus on Moldavia. Uh, Moldavia, which was still at that time and uh, uh, an autonomous province of the Russia, uh, the, sorry, of the Ottoman Empire, uh, received this strip of land along the Prut here and along the Danube, right? And this was important. So uh, uh, this was important. The Crimean War and its consequences was uh, uh, very important for uh, Mold the Mold historical Moldavia for all kinds of reasons. First of all, because both principalities of Moldavia and Wallachia were placed under the collective protection of the great powers which meant, and we'll come back to, uh, to that at the end of my presentation, which meant that the Russian dominance in Moldavia itself, the Romanian Moldavia, came to an end as well. But more importantly, the Russian empire lost the Danube Delta, and this map is not completely accurate here because the Danube Delta should be, you know, uh, belong to Moldavia. Uh, and uh, also it lost the Southwestern part of Bessarabia, this territory. Um, so these territories become part of Moldavia in 1856, and after 1859, after the unification of Moldavia and Wallachia, they become part for 22 years, for, for, for a generation, of the new Romanian nation state. Why this is important? Because this induced an element of uncertainty into the Russian, uh, let's say, domination of Bessarabia, which will come back come back to immediately. So here you have two maps that illustrate nicely this territorial, a new territorial arrangement uh, decreed by the, by the Paris Treaty of 1856. Uh, the first is this red line is the new border between the Ottoman and the Russian empires in the region. And the second map, which is basically the same, but it's a German language map. So I thought it might be more, more interesting. And also it shows you the whole area here uh, so this area in pink is exactly the area ceded by Russia to the Ottoman Empire. Now, what about the southern Bessarabia? Why, why it is important after all? Uh, so this is important, again, from the geopolitical point of view, because it was the first and I guess only retreat, a temporary retreat of the Russian Empire from its expansion in the southern direction. Uh, it was strategically quite important because it comprised the territory adjacent to the Danube Delta. And again, uh, uh, it was given to Moldavia for strategic reasons to, let's say, uh, uh, make Russia as, uh, uh, as weak as possible in, uh, in, uh, on the, in, uh, at the mouth of the Danube. But it's, it, what is interesting is that um, Part of this area already had an exceptional administration under the Russian Empire. Uh, the city of Ismail was administratively separate, separated from the rest of the province. And uh, it was also very interesting from the ethnic point of view, because it was mostly inhabited by so-called Transdanubian colonists, that is Bulgarian and Gagauz, and Russian old believers. And the Romanians only were the majority here. You know, uh, well, around the city of Kakul, let's say, near the Prut River. So it was not a, ma uh, a majority Romanian inhabited area. That is, it invalidates any Romanian national claims uh, that, you know, stating that this region was given to, to, to Moldavia and then to Romania for national reasons. Of course not. It was uh, a purely strategic decision on the part of the great powers. Um, so 
uh, I think, yes. Uh, so Southern Bessarabia was, uh, was a uh, peculiar province, let's say, both under the Romanian nation state uh, from 1856 or 62 to 1878, and then after 1878, because what, ha what happens in 1878, of course, at the Congress of Berlin, is that this area is returned to the Russian Empire. So uh, after 22 years of being part of the Romanian nation building project, this area is suddenly finds itself again in the Russian Empire. And this is quite interesting because what happens is the emergence of the so-called Ismail anomaly. Ismail was the uh, most important city and the center of the uh, southern Bessarabia. Uh, so after this generation of nation, Romanian nation building from 1856 to 78, this region is returned to the empire and what the Russian authorities do, or rather don't do, is they do not uh, introduce uh, the customary Russian administrative model to this province that was, again, uh, in, the, in the eyes of the Russian authorities, redeemed uh, from, the Romanian, uh, from the Romanian nation state. Uh, that is, the Russians, after 1878, preserved the Romanian civil code, they preserved the Romanian law uh, on communal administration in, in southern Bessarabia. Uh, no Zemstvos, no Russian state-based administrative institutions are introduced. Uh, and the principle of civil administration and communal structure are left intact. So this region becomes really an institutional aberration. How can this be explained in an empire that was increasingly centralized and autocratic after the 1880s uh, under Alexander III? Well, I would not recite here uh, all the, re all the uh, factors that I think are important. You can see them here. But uh, it was a peculiar combination of this bureaucratic um, inertia, institutional rivalry, toleration of administrative diversity, and so on. So in a way, uh, Southern Bessarabia, what I want to get at, basically, is that Southern Bessarabia becomes a uh, uh, region of administrative experimentation, both under the R Romanian rule from 1856-78, when these modernizing, nationalizing measures are introduced, and paradoxically under Russian rule after 1878. Uh, until World War I, it preserves its institutional peculiarity, it preserves a rather uncertain geopolitical status. Some Russian observers even claim that it will re return to Romania at some point. So Bessarabia, even after 1812, is still in flux, uh, even after it theoretically uh, was already integrated into the empire, uh, its southern part was still, uh, let's say, an uncertain uh, factor here. So, and here uh, I will shortly ret return to uh, Bessarabia proper, right, right, the rest of Bessarabia. So here you have uh, you have a map from 1883 at the height of Russian imperial uh, control. It's in Russian, but you can see roughly the, the administrative divisions and the uh, con uh, well administrative territorial configuration of the region. So, what are the Russian goals in in the province? Um, basically, one could say that. Uh, the tendency is from this ephemeral autonomy granted to Bessarabia in the early 18, uh, in the late 1810s, 1818, 1828, to increasing centralization, administrative uniformity, and there are several stages of administrative integration and administrative construction of Bessarabia as a part of the Russian Empire. Uh, and here you have these five, uh, let's say, stages that uh, consecrate Bessarabia's belonging to the Russian Empire. So the establishment of a new capital, which was, again, created ex nihilo. So it was uh, Kishinev itself, Kishinev was a rather insignificant settlement before 1812, but it was chosen for purely uh, strategic reasons uh, for, uh, due to its central location. Then uh, the creation of a new separate diocese, the church jurisdiction, then the abolition of the de facto quarantine on the Dniester River, which basically separated Bessarabia from the rest of the Russian Empire and made it possible 
a, uh, a constant uh, circulation of people's uh, people uh, goods and so on between the Moldavian principality and Bessarabia. So in the early 1830s, this was abolished and the uh, border on the Prut was definitively uh, established. Then in the 1860s, the great reforms, uh, the Russian great reforms and their application uh, in Bessarabia uh, is, uh, 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 make this province a much more uh, structurally, much more similar territory to the Russian interior because of this uh, transfer of the peasant reform and these ancestors. And finally, Bessarabia, uh, which was called a region before, is transformed to a gubernia in the 1870s. Now, um, again, uh, I, I would just like to very briefly mention, we can also talk uh, about this during our discussion, if you're interested, uh, about the lines, the basic lines of, this, of uh, Russian policies, imperial policies in, in Bessarabia. So uh, if we talk about the educational and the religious sphere, then uh, the tendency is clearly the gradual elimination of Romanian Moldavian from the public sphere. Uh, the, uh, the church is used increasingly after the 1870s as a tool of Russification. And I would, I would claim actually that uh, despite what national Romanian and Moldovan historiographies argue, uh, Russification only really uh, hit uh, you know, uh, the road, let's say, from the 1870s and 1880s, when there were, uh, at the center there appeared a coherent agenda to Russify the region, which did not mean that it really was very resultative, but anyway. Uh, and uh, so uh, the, the, both the church and the educational institutions are used as tools for uh, imposing an imperial agenda, for uh, curtailing the use of Romanian and one could say for Russification uh, if we talk about the period following the 1870s and the 1880s. Now, um, what about the demographic structure? As I was, uh, because this, this returns us to my previous point about the transformative impact of the empire. Um, uh, and one could uh, so one could see uh, from the only imperial census taken in 1897 in Bessarabia, which claimed a population of almost two million inhabitants, uh, that first there was a clear urban versus rural divide. Uh, second, uh, there was uh, and uh, it's very important to to note that this uh, census did not use did not use ethnic-based categories. It used language as the basic criteria for categorizing populations. So uh, these percent, uh, percent, uh, percentages that you can see here are refer to speakers of a native language, not necessarily to their ethnic identification. And this is important because probably uh, the, uh, the share of Romanians, Moldavians was slightly lower. Probably it was like around half, 50%. But in general, in general, uh, this reflects quite accurately the both the uh, demographic structure and uh, the multi ethnicity, basically, that Bessarabia was uh, right, uh, represented, epitomized um, as uh, other peripheries of the Russian Empire. And also, you know, what we, we can see here in the census is the um, astounding, let's say, differences in literacy between different communities, with Germans at the high end of the spectrum, and not surprisingly, Moldavians, Romanians at the lowest end, uh, which explains uh, also the uh, overlapping of the social and national ethnic divisions, right? So the most, the more rural the population is, like in the case of Moldavians, Romanians, and, and Ukrainians, uh, the least literate, and so on. Um, and also, uh, as I hinted about, there were these structural differences between the so-called regular peasantry, uh, and uh, which was controlled up to an extent by noble landowners in the center and the north of the province, and the colonist settlers of the of the south, which uh, who had a, a completely different status, a privileged status for most of the 19th century. Uh, by the by World War One, as you can see here below, uh, the population reached 2.7 million. And here, there is, this is a 
uh, basically a map from a later period from the next census taken by the Romanian authorities in the 19, in 1930, but actually it is not that different structurally from uh, from uh, the uh, data of the 1897 uh, census. So it's a very uh, intuitive map. Uh, you can see here the color, the violet, uh, are the uh, Romanians and then uh, Ukrainians, the green ones here in the north and in the south, Cossacks, right? Uh, the Russians, the, the, the Germans, the Bulgarians, and so on. So, and you, as you can see, uh, and the Jew, Jewish community, which was, which was of course much wi more widely scattered, but had some uh, here, for example, around Belts and Kalarash and so on, had some, um, uh, um, let's say, territories where they were predominant in, in, uh, predominant in, in urban areas. Okay. So, um, yes, as I just said, Bessarabia was a multi-ethnic borderland. And uh, for most of the 19th century, this multi-ethnicity was uh, sort of, um, uh, well, uh, more or less had the, uh, had the character features of a peaceful coexistence. But uh, during, the early 19, uh, during the early 20th century, um, the so-called Jewish question, of course, uh, in uh, quotation marks, um, was uh, triggered basically the most violent episode in Bessarabian uh, imperial history and probably the event for which Bessarabia was and still is known for, uh, to most uh, people outside of the region itself. Uh, that is the pogrom of 1903. Uh, the pogrom of 1903, the Easter pogrom, which in a way, put Bessarabia on the map in the most unwelcome uh, way possible and the most tragic way possible. And it also um, basically uh, shows how these forces of ethnic violence, ethnic mobilization accumulated in southern Russia and erupted in Bessarabia, which was a, a rather unlikely place for most observers uh, that it could erupt. Uh, but still, uh, this um, conflation of social and ethnic national grievances, the radicalizing role of the press and the local church and so on, uh, these created premises for ethnic violence to an unprecedented degree. And this also led, by the way, uh, to a massive immigration of the Jewish population in Bessarabia, so that if in, in 1897, the Jews made up almost 12% of the population, that is six years before the pogrom. In 1930, at least according to the Romanian census, which was not necessarily very objective, they made up uh, less than 8%, right? So uh, this was due to the a massive immigration of the Jewish population from Bessarabia. And this is perhaps the most uh, important, again, episode of, uh, how ethnic mobilization reached the region in a violent and very unsettling way in the early 20th century. Uh, but aside from this episode, uh, I would say that uh, mobilization of ethnicity was very slow to come to Bessarabia. It was very uh, delayed in comparison to uh, the neighboring regions. And as you can see here, uh, I list here four uh, factors that in my opinion uh, influenced this outcome. And some of them are quite structural, let's say, like the predominantly rural character of the population. Some of them actually are, uh, have, to, have, to, uh, you know, have to do more with the agency of the governing authorities and mainly with the educational policies of the government, which were a failure of the Russian government, of course. Uh, which did not penetrate the rural communities, or if so, only to a limited extent, and uh, which made Bessarabia a, a province in which the majority, uh, the peasantry, and not only the Romanian-speaking, also the Ukrainian-speaking peasantry, uh, but the Bulgarian-speaking uh, colonists even, uh, less so the Germans, but even they, right, uh, were very difficult to mobilize nationally and ethnically. And that's why, that's why one could speak about a sort of national indifference in uh, Bessarabia uh, in the early 20th century. And it also explains, 
Yeah, I'll return to this. It also explains why the pan-Romanian alternative, the Romanian nationalism was very slow to emerge. And uh, um, one can see actually three, uh, let's say, uh, opposing, but also complementary up to an extent, uh, in the sense that how, 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 how the peasants were sought to be mobilized. Three um, uh, alternative identity projects in Bessarabia in the early 20th century. The first, and uh, all of those were, were accelerated by the first Russian revolution. The first, uh, let's say, national project was the so-called newspaper nationalism. I would call it newspaper nationalism because basically this pan-Romanian uh, version of local Bessarabian nationalism was reduced to polemics in the local press. Nothing more really substantially. But still, uh, there were uh, a couple of Romanian language publications that sprang, sprang up in the early 20th century, 1906, 1907, mostly. And there, one could see the first stirrings of this pan-Romanian uh, vision for Bessarabia, very feeble ones. The other alternative project was the so-called regionalist project that not so much insisted on the articulation of a separate provincial identity as uh, uh, sort of uh, relativized the Romanians' claims to Bessarabia uh, because it insisted on local, uh, let's say, realities, on the differences in dialects, uh, in the dialect spoken by Bessarabians as opposed to the Romanians of the Romanian kingdom and so on and so forth. So sort of a regionalist localist approach. And the third quite interesting, albeit marginal, identity project was put forward by the bishop of uh, one of the Russifying bishops of Kishino, uh, of Bessarabia, Serafim Chichagov, uh, who, uh, starting from the uh, local, local debates, language debates, um, in a way tried to, let's say, uh, impose on his uh, subordinates uh, a peculiar vision of Moldovanism, that is, of an antagonism between the, Mold the Bessarabian Romanian speaking population and the Romanian nation itself. So uh, this, uh, this made him, uh, this bishop, one of the first or the first Moldovanists. And as you will see probably in the next le uh, lectures, uh, this antagonism was exploited politically to a much larger extent in the 20th century. But this, this third Moldovanist project remained quite marginal in this sense. So this is this newspaper Basarabia that I was talking about as the epitome of Romanian nationalism in Bessarabia in the early 20, uh, 20th century. And here you can see uh, if, if it's visible at all, the uh, anthem that is now the Romanian national anthem, the Stapa de Romune in Cyrillic. And because of the publication of this anthem in 1907, this publication was banned by the Russian authorities immediately. This is the last issue of the Romanian uh, language, Basarabia. And here you can, uh, you can see two of the notorious, I would say, uh, right-wing radical Russian nationalists who shaped uh, this attempt, these attempts to mobilize the Bessarabian peasantry uh, in the early 20th century and to also uh, fight the threat of separatism, which are mostly in their heads, of course, uh, in Bessarabia. Pavel Kushevan, who needs probably no introduction, he is the one, he is the man behind the pogrom, let's say, at least in conventional wisdom. It, it was a bit more complicated than that. And of course, Serafim Chichagov, the second one I mentioned. So these, these people embody perhaps the best, uh, this radical right wing political alternatives that were uh, widespread throughout southern Russia at that point, and that also tried to tried to uh, create some 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 roots, let's say, in Bessarabia. Okay, now let's say uh, in the final part of my lecture, after focusing so much on Bessarabia, I will try to uh, speak to you a bit about the other two regions of historical Moldavia that were uh, under Austrian imperial rule, that is Bukovina, and under Ottoman first, and then under uh, part of the Romanian nation state, uh, historical Moldavia, the Romanian Moldavia. So uh, what, I, what I would like to do is to uh, mm, 
focus now on the contrasts and on the parallels between, let's say, uh, Bessarabia on the one hand, the Russian controlled province, and uh, the other two parts of historical Moldavia on the other hand. Because as, as I also hinted at the beginning, it, it is very difficult for someone to think about this historical Moldavian region as a whole. So this is what I will try to do through invoking very cursorily, very, very quickly, some structural uh, parallels and differences, let's say, between uh, these three uh, borderlands. So Bukovina, <clears throat> and this synthetic table gives you uh, I'm sorry, Dr. I'm, I'm not sure Dr. Shah will have to object some, or will have a lot of objections here. But it, uh, it tries to show you uh, in a very synthetic way um, the differences in imperial policies between Bessarabia and Bukovina, and, and also the structural differences and similarities between the two provinces. So, and as you can see here, uh, there are a lot of structural similarities between Bessarabia and Bukovina, especially due to the way they were created, after all. Uh, again, as imperial inventions, basically, uh, and uh, carved out uh, uh, out of the historical Moldavian principality. So, no territorial precedence, multi-ethnic, multicultural setting, and by the way, the impact of the empire, the imperial policies, was quite sizable in the two provinces. Only the difference is that perhaps in Bukovina it was not so heavy-handed. Let's say uh, policies of colonization. Yes, of course. Uh, now, with borders, we have here uh, some, some differences because Bessarabia, aside from these uh, shifts in southern Bessarabia that I talked about, had sort of clear cut borders between the Prut and the, the Dniester, the Danube, and the Black Sea. Whereas Bukovina, not that in itself it changed its borders, but it was always uh, either attached or, uh, or um, uh, separated from Galicia. So Bukovina, lures, in a way, Bukovina's territorial identity lurked in the shadow of Galicia, the much more important province to, the, to, its, uh, to its east, um, uh, west, sorry. Uh, so uh, the, the role of local elites was quite uh, different because uh, I, if in Bessarabia you have uh, 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 these early tendencies to co-opt the elites that are quickly uh, replaced by a much more centralizing policy in Bukovina, and I mean here the Romanian-speaking elites mostly, because these were the aristocratic elites. The Ruthenians, of course, in Bukovina did not have an age of aristocracy or acquired it very late, let's say, uh, if we uh, think about the noble uh, people. So uh, uh, in Bukovina, the Romanian elites had a higher status than in the Sarabia. Uh, the Orthodox Church was much more important as a separate institution in Bukovina, whereas in Bessarabia, the Orthodox Church was part of the state, state apparatus and was subordinated to state policies. Uh, it was not an independent actor or an autonomous actor like it was in Bukovina, of course, in very different circumstances. The possibilities for political action, needless to say, were incomparable in the, in the early 20th century. Now, about the status uh, within the Romanian national discourse, I would like to talk a, a, a bit more, but I'm afraid we don't have enough time. Suffice it to say that the marginality of Bessarabia within Romanian national discourse was much more pronounced than in Bukovina's case. Because in Bukovina, we can speak about, let's say, uh, let's make a parallel with Kosovo in the Serbian collective memory. In the sense that Bukovina was perceived by the Romanian nationalists as this medieval heart of the principality where the monasteries of Stephen the Great were erected, where you know, uh, it was, it was uh, the symbolic core of Moldavia, historically speaking. Bessarabia was never, could never claim such status. It was a periphery, even in the um, medieval Moldavian principality. Uh, yeah, similar proportion of Romanian speaking population and so on and so forth. Uh, and also the entanglements between the Ukrainians and the uh, Romanian speaking population were very important in both provinces, much more so in Bukovina, but uh, as, the, as, the uh, as the Ukrainian speakers were the second uh, largest uh, ethnic group in Bessarabia, it, they played a prominent role as well there. Okay, uh, I think I will skip this World War I slide just to make you aware that World War I was an inflection point in uh, in the politics of ethnicity and not only uh, in both Bessarabia and Bukovina. 
and I think my colleagues will talk about it when they deal with the union with Romania after 1917. Uh, and what I would really like to focus now in the final part of my lecture is the third and most important, maybe historically speaking, part of these tripartite borderlands of the historical principality of Moldavia. Uh, and main, uh, namely uh, the Romanian part, the rump principality of Moldavia that had a rather convoluted trajectory after 1812. Because after 1812, uh, 1821, I'll explain immediately why. But in, after 1812, half of, territorially speaking, half of, of uh, um, uh, the historical Moldavian principality was annexed to the Russian empire. Uh, the other province of the, to the north, Bukovina, was, uh, was under Austrian control, so that uh, the remaining Moldavian principality was territorially even smaller than Bessarabia itself, or at least roughly similar. Uh, so that is important because that sort of pushed a lot of people in the Moldavian elites to think very, very insistently about union with Wallachia, uh, because Moldavia's position was weakened fundamentally. And uh, what happens in this roughly century between 1821, 1821 was the uh, abolition of the Fenariot rule in the principalities, and of course the year of the Greek uprising, and 1918 was that Moldavia, so the principality, the remaining principality, were oscillated between these three, let's say, spheres of influence. First of all, the Ottoman, then less so the Austrian, well, uh, the Ottoman, the Russian, and the Western, let's say, uh, if I can use this very simplifying uh, uh, label here. And what I, can, I, I tried to sketch in this slide was a very, very uh, simplified trajectory of this principality uh, from 1821 until World War I. And as you can see, uh, after this transitional period of 1820s, uh, a sort of modernization through Petersburg follows, uh, epitomized or represented by the organic regulations. The first was a constitution that was uh, imposed by the Russian occupation authorities. And uh, this quarter of a century between 1825 and the Crimea, 20, 1829, peace of Adrianople and the Crimean War is a sort of a um, period of Russian hegemony in Moldavia uh, and Wallachia as well. Uh, and a, a period where this modernization through Petersburg reached its limits, because it is important to note that although the organic regulations sort of uh, created a, uh, a, a first basis for political modernization in the Moldavian principality, it was never meant as something to be improved upon or to be radicalized. It was meant to stay that way. So the Russian authorities thought of the organic regulations as what was enough, right? Uh, for reform uh, in, in, in the terms of political reforms. Um, now, the Crimean War was, of course, a turning point as it was for Bessarabia. And uh, the period from the 1830s to the 1860s is perhaps the most important because it witnessed these de development debates, let's say, in, in Moldavia between uh, those who wanted it to follow the Russian uh, part, let's say, to, to, be, to be a part of the Russian sphere. Uh, increasingly fewer, uh, and those who uh, attempted to introduce the 48ers, their Moldavian uh, version, who, who attempted to, to introduce Western political ideas, models, and behaviors, let's say, in the principality. Uh, and then, uh, and uh, I'll abuse five more minutes if you, if you allow me, and then, um, after, after, the, after the Crimean War, after the union with Wallachia, a very interesting thing happens to Moldavia. Um, it sort of uh, starts to become a region that is slowly declining. So the union, again, if you look at the, at the Romanian historiography uh, you know, from the 20th century and especially under national, its national communist guise, you will see, of course, that you know, this triumphalist rhetoric of Moldavia and Wallachia merging in a nation that was absolutely harmonious and so on and so forth. Well, not quite. Uh, it was an asymmetrical union. Wallachia was much larger 
economically much more important, at least after 1860. And uh, the, most of the elites of modern Romania came from Moldavia in, in the sense of their impact on modern Romania. So uh, Moldavia was deprived. It was a region deprived of status, of economic significance, of um, much of its former uh, projects for modernization, which were quite promising in the 1840s, 1850s. Uh, and this led to all kinds of discontent. Uh, for example, there is this last stirring of Moldavian separatism in 1866, when uh, a part of the local elites, pro-Russian mostly, but not only, and the church elites, also Moldavian church elites, that attempted a coup in Yash. Uh, the capital of Moldavia to to undo, undo the union. Well, it was quickly crushed. It was very uncomfortable. I mean, it's an uncomfortable subject in Romanian historiography to this day. There is a colleague in Yash, Mikhail Kiper, who and who writes about these things, and not only him, but uh, it's starting to to garner interest. But what is important is that after 1866, this anti-union forces in Moldavia are really defeated. So what we have in the next half a century is this, I try to summarize it here, simmering discontent, uh, some kind of political negotiations from an increasingly weak position of Moldavian elites in Bucharest, uh, uh, increasing regional disparities, and a relative decline. It was not a complete decline, of course, but Moldavia clearly is the subordinate partner in the union. And just to give you one example, uh, in the security, uh, you know, uh, military security thinking of the Romanian nation state, Moldavia was always sacrificed. So they, for example, uh, all the military schools and so on and so forth, military elites, uh, were focused on how to defend Bucharest, on how to defend the capital. Moldavia was either abandoned to a prospective Russian invasion or very weakly considered or very rarely considered as a territory worth saving in the case of an invasion. That tells you a lot. Again, but to and I'm 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 uh, sorry I would I won't have any time to talk about this Jewish question in Moldavia, which which was somehow very much linked to the Jewish question in Russia and the, uh, the Austrian Empire, and it fueled uh, resentment, it fueled discontent, and it fueled, for example, the 1907 peasant uprising. Uh, in, in Moldavia as, as it was in Wallachia. So anti-Semitism was a very important part in this uh, discourse of victimhood that Molda Moldavian elites tried to articulate uh, in, 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 within modern Romania. But finally, not to end this on a, uh, on a let's say, uh, sad note, uh, one could of course uh, see that by the early 20th century, uh, Moldavians, Moldavian peasants were indeed becoming Romanians, and the success of the nation building, uh, of Romanian nation building in, Mold in Romania and Moldavia was, of course, uh, complete. So, despite all these discontents, despite the relative decline I was talking about, despite uh, Moldavia's subordinate position within the Romanian nation state structurally, uh, there was no doubt by the early 20th century that. Moldavians here became Romanians. And to end, just and to provoke you maybe, uh, imagine these three provinces as three different outcomes of nation building, of imperial policies, of nation building policies. One, Romanian Moldavia, where you have a successful Romanian nation building project. So the second, Austrian Bukovina, where you have a much more multicultural setting with uh, uh, recognized ethnic communities with, with communities that can participate politically and can negotiate politically uh, in a much more in a much freer way, let's say, than Bessarabia. And Bessarabia, which comes, uh, comes out of this long 19th century as a borderland shaped by the Russian Empire, as a borderland which is multi-ethnic, but which has almost nothing to do with Romanian nation building. So in order to understand what comes next, well, and I, I really would like to leave you with this idea, one should take note of the fact that Bessarabia was absent almost completely from the process of Romanian nation building, which was not the case in Bukovina. In Bukovina, there are much more constant connections between the Romanian elites there and the Romanian kingdom here 
in Bessarabia, nothing of the sort, especially after the 1830s. So Bessarabia was profoundly shaped by this uh, Russian, by the, by the Russian imperial policies, and its multi-ethnicity was in no way conducive to a smooth integration into uh, Romania, the Romanian nation state after 1918. And most importantly, Bessarabia was absent again from this project of Romanian nation building, aside from discourse. In, in the discursive sphere, uh, yes, of course, but in reality, uh, the impact of Romanian nation building was almost non-existent. So uh, sorry for abusing my time a bit, and I hope uh, at the end, you'll get something useful from this presentation. Thank you very much for your attention and for your patience.